Okay, guys. I don't know. I'm trying something new today. Can you guys see me? Hear me? I'm wearing Batman. Batman. No, nobody can hear me, huh? You guys can hear me? I got coffee stained tea. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm trying something new today. I'm trying to do a live Q&A with my Skype open, but we need to Skype test. Skype, first, last, I could, he couldn't hear me. I could hear him. But I need someone to call me on my Skype. Najim, what's up, brother, from different mother? A lot of snack bar. Okay. Can someone call me on my Skype to see if people can hear? If they can't hear, then I'm going to shut it down. That's right. Benny, because I want to do what CP does. He's my hero. So maybe we can get people ask me questions live. So let's see. Someone want to test it out? Are you too scared? I guess not. When you need someone to test it out, no one's testing it out. Oh, my goodness. All right. Uh, crisis Almighty, I just said, so can someone call me on Skype so we can see if it's working? Because if not, I'm going to have to shut it down because I don't know if people can hear. Yeah. Oh, my neck. Hey. Yeah, see, hey, first last, why don't you give up, bro? Your your Skype sucks, first last. Give it up. Oh, it's not you guys, it's me. Sorry, but because <laughs> I'm accidentally hanging up. All right. Hey. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you through YouTube. Okay, then that's terrible. Can you guys hear him? We hear people. Put a one in the chat if you guys can hear me. Yeah, yeah, they can hear you. So that means it's your part, bro. You, they can hear you on my Skype. So your Skype is terrible. So guys, you can call in your questions on Skype. My, my Skype sucks. Okay. Like we can hear your mother in the background speaking. Tikanis kesikala. Okay, folks, that means you can, yes, that means you can call, man. Hold on, let me see. There we go. All right, that's it. Now we're going to be like CP style, baby. Why is it I cannot find this? Yeah, let me just ask this guy. Why is it so impossible to find Jochen? Can you put it on my page in my articles? This because I've been looking all day, it doesn't show up, and I'm getting angry. Can you put it where it's accessible? Because I've been looking for it. I think this is it. Yeah, this is it. Okay, we finally found it. Boy, all right. That's good, guys. Now we're hoping that the internet connection stays strong. That's right, Batman. Pray I lose. I got to lose 50 pounds. I've only been maintaining, trying not to gain, because I've been settling. And now with the coronavirus, we ain't going to be going to no gym anywhere. <laughs> it's not funny. Okay? It's not funny. One Abdul like Abdul, Abdul. Abdul, Abdul, Abdul. So, guys, the Skype is open. First, last, do you want to po post my Skype name? It's open. If you guys want to ask me a question via Skype, because this is why... <clears throat> I titled it Live Q&A and Open Skype Session. To see now in the future, we'll use Skype for people who want to call in or even debate. And if you get out of hand, if you have Skype, Stephen, anyone can call. All right? So we're connected to the modem. The Wi-Fi is off. Hopefully, it'll stay strong. We may get some buffering, but in Jesus' name, I pray the buffering <clears throat> goes away completely. It's 99% better. And today is a very gloomy day. It's raining. It's been raining all day. Whoever wants to call. But let's ask the Lord to bless because this is the time to ask your question. Uh, hold on. Let's get rid of this demon. Sorry about that. We got a demon here that needs to go. Hold on. Hold on, folks.
all mine in love, but with it without you. Hold on, guys. Sorry about this. If you guys want to call, call, man. All right. I'm on a man, but it is without you. What is it without? I mean, it's a full right. I'm going to pray. All right. Okay, then. Can you guys hear me? Sorry, I just to get another distraction. Everything good? Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. In Jesus' almighty name. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. We ask that you bless this session, Father, in Jesus' almighty name, that you fill us with the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. And Father, please destroy all distractions, all attacks of the enemy. Grant us the power of your Holy Spirit to stay focused. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, with wisdom and knowledge from your Holy Spirit. And Father, please, in Jesus' almighty name. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Save us from unrighteous anger, unholy indignation. And please, Father, save me in Jesus' name from being a stumbling block. And protect me, Lord, that others will not cause me to stumble and grieve your Holy Spirit. And anoint this session, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Enable me to recall the passages and interpret them correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ. Purify our hearts. Purify our motives in Jesus' almighty name. Yahweh, Father, Holy Spirit. Guys, I'm going to start blocking you guys from Skype. Do you know why? You see that I'm praying, and you still call. First victim is Young. Bye-bye, Young. Let me block this guy. See? In the midst of my prayer, you guys are going to call? Seriously? Isaac, make my day. Call me so I can block you here and there. You guys expect. Unbelievable. No respect. Here I'm praying, asking Jesus Christ to show up and bless us, and you guys call. No respect for the Lord. And letting me finish, asking Jesus to bless that Christ will be glorified. My goodness, unbelievable. Uh, that young pow guy, Kung Pao Chicken, what's your name? Because I'm going to block you from my channel. You guys cannot wait for me to finish asking Jesus to bless the session. I, I, it is unbelievable that Christians could be that dis dishonorable. My goodness. All right. You're the guy that called Remy? Please tell me it was you. Is it okay now? Yeah, so behind. Sorry about that, guys. Unbelievable. In Jesus' name, Father, forgive us. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Holy Spirit, forgive us. And forgive me, Lord. Destroy my unrighteous anger, my, my unholy indignation, my impatience, Father. Loosen my tongue to speak truth without errors, to speak it clearly. And please, Father, you don't need us. You don't need these sessions. We ask that you bless these sessions, bless the Internet connection, bless our union, that you will unify us by the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us, the blood of Jesus Christ purifying us, the blood of Jesus Christ washing us from our filth, from our flesh. Destroy our flesh and the fruit of our flesh, Father. Save us from our flesh, Lord. Save us from instigations of the evil one. The blood of Jesus Christ being our shield against Satan. The blood of Jesus giving us power to overcome Satan. And seal us by your spirit, Father. Lord Jesus, seal us by your Sp Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, seal us. And Holy Spirit, loosen my tongue. Save me from error, we beg you. And stammering and confusion. And take over this session that Jesus Christ will be glorified. And again, Holy Spirit, I ask that you strengthen our bond, our love for each other. Sealed by your power. Filled with fruit from having victory always. Have your way in this session and guide this discussion. Please bless these sessions and transform us to become more like Jesus Christ and the way we worship our God, love our God, serve our God, and the way we love one another. We need you, Holy Spirit. I need you desperately, desperately to save me from my own sinful passions and from the world and from the havoc and the panic that Satan's bringing on this world. Strengthen us to be salt of the earth and light of the world, glorifying Jesus Christ in this darkness so that Jesus will never be ashamed of us and that we will never shame the Lord Jesus and bless our loved ones, my daughters, wash them in the blood of Jesus and seal them and fill them for the glory of Jesus Christ. We need you. We love you, Father. We need you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We need you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Now that I'm done, now you guys can call. You see, you guys can't even wait a minute. 
Now the Skype is open. Now, by the way, the Skype is not open for you to come and call and just to chew the fat. I didn't open up the Skype for you guys. Hey, Sam, I just want to talk to you. No, the Skype is open if you have sincere questions. Only call if you have sincere questions by the grace of Jesus Christ, because this is a live stream and I want to benefit everyone. And I will trust the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit to fill us, save me from stammering confusion for the glory of Jesus Christ, to glorify Jesus Christ, to be in love with Jesus Christ, so that the Holy Spirit will have complete control over the session, over the questions and answers, and over our lives, because we need him desperately to live the victorious Christian life. So only Skype me if you have a question. This is not the time to say, hey, Sam, I just want to talk to you, you know, and how's the weather there, and what's your social security number, and hey, how's life treating you? That's not what it's for. So if you have questions, ask me. You can ask me in the text as well. You don't need to call if you're afraid. You can ask. This is Q&A. This is your time. I'm probably going to do another session after this. I'm planning to do at least two sessions. If God is pleased, if the Father wants me to, if the Lord Jesus anoints me to, and the Holy Spirit moves me to do it. Because right now, all we have is time. Now that they're locking us up in our homes, all we have is time. So let's make the most of the time. Devote ourselves to intense prayer, and I pray that I will practice what I preach and not to be, be a hypocrite. Save me from my flesh. Hypocrisy, Holy Spirit, please. More prayer, more fasting, more studying the word, more worshiping our God, and trying to also be there for those who need help during this time, right? Because you're going to be locked in your house for a while. God knows when you'll come out. Why are you scared, dude? If you have a sincere question, ask. And by the way, if you guys call... And start attacking, I'll just block you. So don't be afraid. Any questions? This is your time to ask me questions. And I pray in Jesus' name, the Lord will bring many, if he's pleased to use me, to these sessions. Now let's see if it's a sincere question. Hello? Hello, potato. Hey, brother. How you doing? Glory to Jesus Christ. This is news. You're the first customer, buddy. The first customer. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know why people weren't calling, but there is one question that I have that's been coming up a lot uh, because of the coronavirus. A lot of people are quoting Psalms 91. Yeah. And from my understanding, that was a promise um, straight uh, directly to Israel. Yes. Um, not saying that God will not protect us because God's the same today, um, yesterday and, for, and forever. But um, is that correct, my understanding? Uh, I don't know what you mean. Are you saying it's only for Israel and it's not applied to believers? Well, well, people are saying this guy was saying that it's impossible for him to be infected by the coronavirus no, that's silly. because of that verse. No, that's silly. That's a misinterpretation, misapplication of the passage. Jesus Christ, the Lord, does not say we will never get sick or disease. His promise to us is if we truly love the Lord Jesus Christ and we're truly connected to the Lord Jesus Christ, and obviously we don't love him perfectly, but we're striving to. He will give us the grace to endure. He will preserve us in spite of what we go through. He doesn't mean he will necessarily save us from getting sick. But if we do get sick and he permits it, he'll give us the grace and the power to endure it, even if that sickness results in our physical death. And I'll prove that to you from Scripture, that there's nothing in the Bible that guarantees that no Christian will ever suffer and it doesn't mean if you get sick or if you suffer, that's because of some unrepentant, unconfessed sin in your life. The Lord Jesus can discipline you for sins that you are not repenting of, sins that you are indulging willfully, even though you know it's sinful and grieves the Holy Spirit, but not everyone gets sick. And again, I want to emphasize this. It's not just for you. I want everyone to hear this. I'm trusting the Holy Spirit to save me from error and anoint me to speak truth clearly, interpret God's word correctly, and live it out in Jesus' name. Because everything good is from the Spirit. I just want to emphasize, if you're sick, that's not necessarily because of unrepentant, unconfessed sin, or you lack faith. It can be that. But again, it may be simply God permitting you to get sick, not so much because he's disciplining you for unrepentant sin, but to also teach you to trust in him, <clears throat> and to take you to a higher level 
of dependency on Christ, to trust in him, even when you're sick, that he's with you and give you the grace either, either to overcome the sickness or if it's God's will for you to enter glory through that sickness, he will not leave nor forsake you, but give you the grace to endure it because ultimately our citizenship is in heaven, meaning we are strangers sojourning in a strange land. This fallen earth is not ours. The new heavens and the new earth will be our everlasting possession. In the new heavens and new earth, where God transforms this fallen creation, there'll be no more sin, no more disease, no more pain, no more suffering, no more Satan. That is our inheritance. But until the new heavens and new earth, in this fallen world that is plagued by Satan's sin, and because of sin and Satan, bodies are perishing and decaying, we will suffer the effects of the fall. But then ultimately, in the new heavens and new earth, there is no more curse. But now let me give you biblical passages to confirm this because I said a mouthful. Let's take this step by step. Let's, let's focus on this question, folks. Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. And thank our brother first last. He'll be posting for me. So 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Let me take it step by step. Okay. First of all, if you do get sick, or if you do get a virus, that's not necessarily because God is punishing you because of some sin or because you're weak in your faith. Because here you see 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. This is Paul talking about the Lord Jesus using his <clears throat> trials, his suffering to keep him humble, to keep him teachable and keep him dependent on the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lest he becomes puffed up and he thinks of himself more highly than he should because apart from Jesus Christ, we're absolutely nothing. Now pay attention to what Paul says. The Lord Jesus permitted, allowed an angel of Satan to torment Paul, to prick Paul. Now Paul doesn't tell us the nature of his affliction from this evil, wicked, unclean spirit. Now how do I know it's an evil, wicked, unclean spirit? Let's read. Given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. Those of you who read the Greek New Testament, you'll see that the word messenger here is the same word for angel. That's why other translations render this passage as an angel of Satan, an angel under the order of Satan, an angel who works for Satan, an angel who's part of the kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of evil, who receives orders from Satan, his Lord. So this is an evil angel, an evil spirit given authority by Christ, in other words, Christ allowing him to torment Paul, to cause Paul suffering in his flesh. What was that suffering? Was it a disease? We don't know because Paul doesn't go into detail, but it says a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times I asked the Lord. I prayed to the Lord, Lord, deliver me from this that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now notice what he goes on to say, latter part of uh, verse 9. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches. I delight when people insult me. I take pleasure when I have a sickness or a human ailment, right? <clears throat> In necessities, even when I'm in need, I rejoice and I delight. And when I'm persecuted, I rejoice and I delight. When I'm experiencing distresses like this pandemic, this panic, I rejoice, I delight, I am joyful. Why? For Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now let me break it down for everyone. And I hope you're paying attention, guys. This is where I need you to pay attention. Don't be distracted. Let's focus on the Word of God, trusting the Spirit to bless this session. Okay, listen to what Paul is saying here. One of the ways in which the Lord Jesus kept me humble did not allow me to get proud, preventing me from then being condemned because of pride and conceit. He allowed me to experience a physical infirmity. Pay attention here. The wisdom of the Lord Jesus, how he works in our lives to make us more like him and depend on him and trust in him. So there was this physical infirmity that was brought upon by an angel of Satan. So learn, guys, pay attention, learn. That some diseases, some physical infirmities are the result, the work of the kingdom of darkness. 
In other words, what you learn here is that Satan and evil spirits do have the power and the authority to inflict people with physical infirmities, physical ailments, and diseases. Is that clear? Before I move on. Is that clear to everyone? Before I move on. So it is clear, right? Okay. So the spirit realm, both the demonic realm and the righteous angels of God do have power and authority to inflict people with ailments, with diseases, with viruses. That's number one. Number two, why did the Lord allow an evil spirit to inflict Paul with a physical infirmity? This was Jesus' way of saving Paul from falling into the sin of pride and being condemned. Do you understand that? So Paul wasn't <clears throat> afflicted and inflicted with this <clears throat> infirmity because he had sin. He was afflicted <clears throat> with this infirmity so that he would not end up sinning. It was God's way of saving him from sinning and com coming under God's condemnation. That's the second point before I move on. Did everyone get that? Before I move on. So was Paul afflicted with this physical infirmity by an evil spirit because he had sin? Or because this was Jesus' way of saving him from falling into the sin of pride? Now, how did this affliction prevent Paul from sinning against Christ? Because Paul then realized he's utterly weakless. Weak, I'm sorry. Utterly weak, helpless is the word, as the Holy Spirit protects me from error. Hopeless and utterly weak and nothing apart from Christ. In other words, this was Jesus' way of teaching him, everything good you have, everything good you do, everything praiseworthy you've accomplished, it's because of my power. It's because of the Holy Spirit in you. Don't take credit for your achievements. Don't get puffed up and think as if it's something you've done in your own strength. Because apart from me, Paul... You are nothing. Apart from me, Paul, you're utterly weak and helpless and hopeless. Apart from me, Paul, you are a maggot and a worm. All the great things you've done, praiseworthy things you've done, things that delight God, you did because of my power, because of my strength, because of my grace, because of my love, and because of the Holy Spirit in you. So what did you learn here? Sometimes the Lord Jesus will allow you to be afflicted, to prevent you from sinning, and also to teach you to depend on Christ, to trust in Christ, because it's Christ who empowers you to do the things that are good in the sight of God. And it is Christ who preserves you for his glory. So did we learn that here? Everyone learned this? So excellent question, but I'm going to build on this question. I'm not done yet. And notice when Paul said, take it away from me, Jesus didn't take it away. He said, no, I will allow this to afflict you in order to teach you to depend on me and endure. So here you learn that Jesus won't necessarily save you from affliction, but give you the grace and the power to undergo an affliction without that affliction destroying your faith. Making sense? Before I move on. So what does that mean for us in the present crises? The Lord may not take away the coronavirus in a week or two. He may allow this panic and epidemic to continue for months in order to stretch us and squeeze us to teach us not to fear what man fears, not to panic, but to truly put our faith to the test, our money where our mouth is, and cry out to Jesus, <clears throat> ask Jesus to sustain us and preserve us. So this is the time where the Lord Jesus will sift the wheat from the chaff, the men from the boys, the women from the girls. Because a lot of people are thinking, oh, yeah, it's only going to be two weeks. Right now, they're projecting that we may be quarantined for at least up to 18 months, folks. And this is not the time to panic. This is the time to now pray more. This is the time to study your Bible more. This is the time to start singing praises more. This is the time to now join other Christians online and worship Jesus together more and do more Bible studies, more teaching sessions, not less. 
This is the time. May Jesus destroy our fears and our doubts and rebuke panic from us. Because he is God. He is risen. He is alive. And he loves us. Even though we may not feel that he does. Right? Now, let me give you a couple other verses that show you that it's not necessarily the case. Jesus will save you from a disease. Nor is it the case that if you get a disease or illness, that's because Jesus is punishing you because of your weak faith or unrepentant sin. Everyone with me? You understanding what I'm trying to get at? Not every affliction or disease is because of unrepentant, unconfessed sin or because of lack of faith. Sometimes these afflictions or diseases are just the consequences of being born in a fallen world, a fallen world that is tainted by the sin of Adam and Eve and the corruption of Satan. So that even Jesus himself, pay attention to this, even Jesus himself who was sinless but voluntarily chose to enter this fallen world, allowed himself to suffer the consequences of the sin of Adam and Eve and the corruption of Satan and the sins of others, which is why his body could grow old and decay and die. But he himself was absolutely sinless. So why did he suffer those ailments, those afflictions, because he entered a world that was fallen and he shared in the lot and the fate of a fallen world, a fallen world that brings diseases, afflictions, and even death, diseases to even infants and children who've done nothing, no sin against God to bring about such affliction. Is that clear? Sorry for me getting loud. It's just my nature. I get loud when I talk about these things. But I hope you're listening, right? Now, let me show you, not every disease, not every affliction is because of some sin in your life or some sin in your parents' lives. John 9, verses 1 to 3. John 9, verses 1 to 3. Thank this brother, Kevin, for this excellent question. And I'm going to thoroughly answer it. And thank you for your support, guys. God bless you. In fact, that's what we need. Pray the Lord Jesus will sustain us, giving us our daily bread, and the provisions we need, so we depend on no man but on him and his grace. Okay, John 9, verses 1 to 3, read with me. And thank first and last for posting, helping me to help you. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. He was born blind. He came out of his mother's womb blind. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did this sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now notice what our Lord says. Notice what our Lord says. Thank you, Sandeep. In verse 3, Jesus answered, Neither, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Did you catch it? Neither this man nor his parents sinned. So he wasn't born blind because of the sin of his parents or the sin of this man in his mother's womb, that somehow in his mother's womb he sinned and God punished him. So he wasn't inflicted with blindness as punishment. But that blindness, blindness, is the result of the fall, meaning if Adam and Eve had not sinned, and I'm trusting the Spirit to guide me to speak accurately in accord with Scripture, and I pray you're listening. If Adam and Eve had not sinned, if Satan had not rebelled, if Satan had not corrupted the world, we would not experience diseases, <clears throat> infirmities that would not have existed. But the reason why you have even children born blind or with cancer, because our bodies have been tainted and corrupted because of the sin of Adam and Eve and the corruption of the devil, the corruption that he spread throughout the entire world, right? But what did you learn from the Lord here? That man was not born blind, but because of his parents having physical bodies that now have <clears throat> the potential to conceive children with infirmities, to conceive children with infirmities, I don't know who's that. Someone else? Some children are born with physical ailments and diseases and infirmities. Now, let me repeat that again. Jesus said the, parent, the man's parents did not sin, but still the mother conceived a child that was blind. Why? Though he wasn't born because of any sin of his parents or any sin he did, still our bodies are under the effect and the curse of, of the sin of Adam and Eve and the corruption of the devil. So though his mother hadn't sinned and his father hadn't sinned to bring about the blindness of their unborn child, 
Still, their bodies are affected by sin, tainted by sin, corrupted by sin, so that each parent can conceive a child who will suffer the ill effects of bodies that are less than perfect, less than ideal. Is that clear? You understand what I just said? A mother who loves Jesus, who hasn't sinned against the Lord to bring discipline. A father who loves Jesus, who hasn't sinned against the Lord to bring discipline. <clears throat> they have a child. She conceives. And yet the child comes out blind or with cancer. But hold on. The parents did not do anything sinful to bring about such discipline upon their child. Nor did the child sin. So why? Because their bodies are still affected and corrupted by the fall. So their bodies are less than in an ideal state. So our bodies, our genetic material, the genetic design of our bodies are such that we, we will always take a chance in having a child who will, born, will be born with defects because our bodies have been corrupted and tainted and are not in their ideal state. Not because of any unconfessed sins on their part or the unborn child's part. Is that clear? I'm trying to repeat myself more than once and be as clear as possible to glorify Jesus Christ by speaking as accurately as possible. Is that making sense? Before I move on to the next point. Thank you, Christos Anesti. Most miscarriages are due to chromosomal defects too. Exactly. But why are these chromosomes less than optimal? Defected because of the fall. And because of the permeating, corrupting, sinful influence of Satan. So I just want to be clear. A person who's afflicted with an infirmity or disease. That's not because God is disciplining that person. Or punishing that person for some unrepented, unconfessed sin. On his part, her part, or the parent's part. That's what Jesus just said. But even with that said. Those who are born with such physical infirmities <clears throat> will still be able to glorify God through their infirmities to leave us who are fully well with no excuse and to shame us to repentance, just like that Christian brother who has no arms and no legs. And yet he's doing more for the glory of the triune God, more in glorifying Jesus Christ, more in bringing people to Jesus than us with bodies that are fully intact, who are lazy Carnal, laid back, and could not care about loving Jesus, worshiping Jesus, praising Jesus, praying to Jesus, singing to Jesus, and reaching the lost with the good news of Christ. So that man's infirmity is being used by God to silence us who have no physical infirmities and to show he's not the one with an infirmity. You are a spiritual one, and he puts you to shame. What is your excuse? A man with no hands and no legs and has a beautiful godly wife who married him, who gave him godly children, beautiful, healthy children. As a testimony, that man is not handicapped. He is glorifying Jesus Christ much more than thousands of, thousands of us with limbs intact. And that's what Jesus meant in John 9, 3. Did you catch it? Neither the man nor his parents sin, but this blindness will bring God glory. This infirmity was permitted by God because this infirmity will abound to glorify God and bring many to the feet of Jesus Christ. Clear? Did everyone get that so far? As Holy Spirit saves me from stammering and confusion. So, not every infirmity, not every disease, is because of some unconfessed, unrepentant sin on your part or lack of faith. That's number one, okay? Number two, the Lord will permit you to be afflicted with an infirmity or even a virus in order to teach you to trust in Him, to depend on Him, to cling to Him, showing you that without Him, you are nothing, you're helpless and hopeless and even worthless, you are what you are because of the goodness of Jesus. The grace of Jesus will preserve you. Now, preserving you may, may mean he may heal you. He may not heal you. He may allow you to linger with that disease till you die and enter glory. 
right? Until you die and enter glory, right? Do you want to make sure you're getting this? Okay. And remember what I said, the implication of 2 Corinthians 12, 7 was, an evil spirit creature, an angel of Satan, was allowed to torment Paul with a physical infirmity. What's the implication of that? Whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, the spirit realm, not just God, angelic creatures, good and bad, have been created by God with the ability to inflict physical disease and harm. To afflict us with diseases. Satan, evil spirits, and righteous angels were created with the authority and the ability and power from the triune God. To inflict people with diseases. Are you with me there? So cancer is not necessarily a work from God. Cancer can be the result of a spirit creature who has the ability to inflict you with cancer with God's permission. Is that clear? Because I'm going to give you more verses to prove it. Are you ready now for more biblical proof? Okay. If you're ready for more biblical proof and you're paying attention, I need you to learn because this is meat. We're going into meat now. Trust the Holy Spirit to bring us to meat, to speak truth without error for the glory of Jesus, to trust Jesus more perfectly and love him more passionately because I'm excited right now. Man, this guy's question put me on fire. The Holy Spirit used this question to put me on fire with passion for Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for this question. Now, Luke 13, Luke 13, 10 to 17. Luke 13, 10 to 17. And thank you for the support, brothers and sisters. God bless you for your love and support. Luke 13, 10 to 17. Guys, pay attention. Please read. Don't let agents of Satan distract you in the comment section. Focus. Luke 13, 10 to 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity. She had a hunchback, curvature of the spine. She was hunched over, a hunchback, curvature of the spine. 18 years she had this spirit of infirmity. 18 years she was afflicted. 18 long years afflicted with curvature of the spine. How do I know it's a curvature of the spine? Let's continue reading. And was bowed together. Did you catch it? And could not wise lift up herself. She couldn't lift up. I've actually seen women with severe curvature of the spine. It even looked abnormal as it was something spiritual, not just physical. Right? And here you see a woman bent over, could not stand up. Because she had the spirit of infirmity. And Jesus says this was given to her. She was afflicted by the devil. Bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, to, unto her, Lord, let me recite these words perfectly and powerfully in Jesus' name. Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now watch. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation and anger because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, there are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed and not in the Sabbath day. Right? A self-righteous legalist here who cares more about the letter of the law than the spirit of the law. And I'll get back to the difference between following the letter of the law and following the spirit behind the law. Okay, now, 15, notice what our Lord says, verse 15. Pay attention, read 15. The Lord then answered and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? That even the Sabbath you don't neglect your animals who are less valuable, less precious than human souls. And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Did you catch it? Luke 13, 16. Guys, pay attention. Satan bound her with this curvature of the spine. Her physical ailment was from Satan. 
So if you believe the Bible, then you believe the God of the Bible is real. You believe the spirit realm is real. You believe Satan is real. And if you believe that, then you must believe that some physical ailments, diseases, even cancer, even <clears throat> mental disorders, narcissism, bipolar disease, schizophrenia, may be the work of Satan and evil spirits, according to the Bible. Not all diseases are from Satan. Not all afflictions are from evil spirits. But some definitely are. Right? So you need to be balanced biblically. You don't see a demon behind every affliction. So when you sneeze, I rebuke the demon of sneezing. No, no. That's going extreme. But you can't go to the opposite extreme that no physical ailment, no mental disorder is the work of the spirit realm. That's now going to the opposite extreme. You need to be balanced. Some diseases, mental disorders are the result of direct spiritual attack and some are not. You want me there? Some are not. Now, this brings me to a further point, a further point. Even though not all afflictions, infirmities, and diseases, not all afflictions, infirmities, and diseases are the result of personal sin in your life or the sins of your loved ones or parents, which are now aff afflicting you as part of God's discipline and judgment, some diseases are. The Bible says that some diseases, some afflictions, some calamities are the result of God's punishment, discipline for unconfessed, unrepentant sins in your life. And let me give you an example. In John 5, Jesus healed a paralytic, a man who was paralyzed for about 38 years. And Jesus healed him. Now, there are two instances of miraculous healing of <clears throat> paralytics. That give us the age. One in Acts 4. The other in John 9. And sometimes I confuse the age of the two. But if memory serves me well. And I pray the Holy Spirit saves me from error. It says 38 years in John 9. But you guys double check and correct me. Because again I don't want to be wrong. And I trust the Holy Spirit to correct any misinformation on my part. When Jesus heals the man. The paralytic. Notice what he says to him in John 5.14. John 5, 14. So glory to God, 38, you see? Elephants don't forget. So I'm not, I don't forget. John 5, 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. Post that one more time. John 5, 14, so they can see it. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. So Jesus says, your sin can bring great affliction, infirmities, and diseases. They can. And he said, they will. If you willfully sin, knowing that what you're doing grieves God, angers God, upsets Holy Spirit, and you still do it anyway, then you're playing with fire and you're tempting the Lord your God. And you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Unless you want to arouse God's righteous anger and judgment upon you. Everyone got it? You got demons here. We're being used of the devil to attack and distract. Let's go to Romans 1, 26 to 27. Romans 1, 26, 27. I'll give you two more examples. That was a good question, and I'll open up to other questions. Brother, I, if you, unless you have another question, I'll hang up to allow others to call. Kevin. Ed. Sorry, Kevin. I thought you, you, you had hung up. If you didn't call me back, you have another question. But let's read this. Romans 1, 26 to 27. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affection. Here it's talking about people who know God exists, but choose to ignore him. Or deny his existence because they don't want to be morally accountable to him. Because they want to worship the creature. Worship their own desires. 
and justify their sinful passions instead of turning away from their sinful passions and submitting to God. So what does God say is the judgment of these people? What does God do to these people who know God exists but want to now live in a manner contrary to his moral code because they don't want to submit to God. They want to be the gods of their own lives, justifying their own pleasures and indulging in their sinful passions and not have to give an account for such immoral, evil, wicked behavior. What does God say will happen to these people? Romans 1, 26 to 27. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Even women engaged in lesbianism, lesbian acts, which is unnatural, contrary to the order of things, the way God originally designed creation to function. And then Romans 1, 27. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burnt in their lust one toward another. Men, pay attention here. This is going to get us arrested soon. But we preach the truth as the Lord Jesus blessed the internet connection and keeps it strong. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Oh, wow. Do me a favor first last. Can you post Romans 1, 27 in another translation, maybe DSV? Notice what God said is the punishment, the judgment of lewd, immoral behavior. And willful defiance of God and the willful <clears throat> indulgence of creature worship where you worship your own desires, worship yourself, and put your desires ahead of God. Romans 1.27. Guys, pay attention. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves, in their bodies. In themselves means in their own bodies. The due penalty for their error. Black and white, in your face, the Bible says, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, are God's judgment upon immoral, lewd <clears throat> behavior. Right there in Romans 127. I know it's not politically correct to preach this. It'll get you in trouble and throw you in jail. May Jesus Almighty, by his Almighty Spirit, seal us and fill us. To never deny Jesus, shame Jesus, or pervert his word, and preach the truth even if it lands up lands us up in jail. Lord Jesus, save us from fears. Even if we land up in jail, he is worthy by the power and life of your Holy Spirit. You see that? Romans 127. Folks, whether you like it or not. Hold on. Before you ask me a question, hold on. Whether you like it or not, folks, whether you like it or not. The Bible says certain sinful behavior will bring about judgment and discipline such as sexual immorality, homosexuality, lesbianism. This is why you find those who are sexually immoral, premarital sex, heterosexual relationships with multiple partners or men on men, women on women. And you see what happens, STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. And that's what Paul said would be the result of such defiance and sinful disobedience. Romans 1, 27. What's up, brother? What's your question? Hey, Sam. How's it going, man? Um, I have two questions. Um, Give me one at a time. Give me one first. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the first question I want to ask about the, the coronavirus that's going on right now. Yeah. Uh, is there a possibility that the... Um, the coronavirus could um, pave the way for the for the for the microchip. No because clue, brother. I can't speak presumptuously. So please don't ask me questions about how prophecy will unfold, because this is not the first disease that caused people to think that this was paving the way for the antichrist. So mm. no, I, I, I don't ask me to speak on issues, and I'm going to give an answer to the Lord. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to blame you on the day of judgment. Okay. Um, You'll be my scapegoat. Right. Is that okay? So when I stand before I say, Lord, he asked me the question. So can you blame him? <laughs> right? Anyway. So what's the other question? And let me repeat that again. Let me explain. Guys, I know this panic and epidemic is causing people to ponder whether this is paving the way 
for a one world government and the Antichrist. Everything that takes place is paving the way for the return of Jesus Christ. But to say that this coronavirus specifically is paving the way, I'm sure that's what many end time doom preachers said about the swine flu, right? I, I'm, I guarantee if you go back, if you go back and you listen to some of the sermons, when the swine flu was on the rise and <laughs> caused people to panic, they were saying the same thing about the swine flu. What happened then? So guys, don't panic and don't start becoming doomsday preachers and end time prophecy experts because I don't know if the coronavirus is that one virus that will force us into one world government or there are many more viruses to come until the man of lawlessness is revealed and Jesus comes down. All I know is I focus on Jesus and the things that I'm certain of, which is that Jesus is alive. He is risen. He is Lord. He's almighty over any and all viruses. And if I'm trusting in him and clinging to him and I'm covered by his blood, I will be okay. Even if that means I get the virus and die because then I enter his presence and I will be completely alive, pain-free, disease-free, <clears throat> and no more misery, no more depression. So glory to the Lord Jesus. Now, what's the second question? And the second question is a little bit, I, I don't want to go off topic. I don't know if, if we can ask. No, any, it's any questions. As the Holy Spirit gives me unction, okay. anointing to speak, I'll speak. Okay, I didn't want to go off. Yeah, I mean, I noticed that there's a trend of a lot of, um, I want to go into a race issue. But I noticed there's a trend of a lot of um, black people, yes. especially black men going into Islam. Yes. And... I've been doing a lot of research and I realized that Islam still even still have black people in captivity uh, yep. today. Yes. yes so exactly. why, why are they, why are they becoming Muslim? Islamic religion? Yeah. Knowing that Muhammad was, a, was a, literally had black people. Who know, what makes you think they know that? Mm. What makes you think? See, again, let me, let me hammer and emphasize this point. Many people are ignorant about their own faith tradition, let alone the faith tradition of someone else. So when you talk about blacks converting to Islam, how many of those young black men and women knew the Bible and knew <clears throat> what the Bible taught about the Trinity, the two natures of Christ, his death on the cross for our sins, his physical bodily resurrection? <clears throat> how many of the people who left Christianity knew the evidences that the Holy Spirit has given to reinforce our faith and trust in the Bible as God's word. How many of them knew that? Not a lot. All right. How many of them knew in Islam enough before making a decision to follow Islam? How many of them were duped into believing a <clears throat> sanitized version of Islam right. that does not exist in the primary sources because of some Islamic preacher who may have been deceiving them or he himself may have been ignorant concerning what his own sources teach. <laughs> right? So when you say, why would they follow Muhammad, who was a white man and a black slave owner? Because the Hadiths clearly say he was a white man and he owned black slaves and sold black slaves. And he even gave up seven female slaves for Safiya. A lot of people don't know this. with the slaves too. Uh, uh, yes. My research, it was like really bad. But now notice, you researched it. How many of the people who became Muslims researched that? And how many of these Muslims, when you tell them that, are going to believe it or think that it's simply Islamophobia, uh -huh. that it's hate because you're trying to <clears throat> slander, quote unquote, the prophet and attack the religion <clears throat> because you're an Islamophobe and agent of the devil? Hmm. That's this. I get, I get what you're saying. So that's the thing. So let me repeat my answers to your two questions. Number one, let's not venture into <clears throat> the coronavirus being the means through which God will bring about the one world system and the Antichrist and the return of Jesus. Maybe, maybe not. But you can look at the history of the church and how many viruses in the past were taken to be the, that one epidemic that would now bring about the collapse of the economy, the rise of the Antichrist, and the return of Jesus, only to turn out to be not the case at all, and causing further embarrassment to our Christian witness. 
right? And you guys know what I'm talking about because even the comment section, you mentioned the swine flu, you mentioned polio, chicken pox, smallpox. Virtually every disease that hit mankind, Christians took to be the one disease that would bring about the collapse of the world, the collapse of the economy, and the return of Christ. And they were wrong. They were wrong. So we don't want to venture into whether this is going to play out in such a way to bring about the one world government, the Antichrist, the return of Christ. Because if we're wrong, we're going to embarrass our Christian testimony. And people are going to say, see, these Christian nuts, they're a bunch of idiots and morons. They're zombies believing in a fictional, mythical fairy tale of a story. We do not want to shame Jesus Christ. We don't want to discredit the glory of Jesus Christ by panicking or becoming doomsday preachers, preaching the end of the world, if it turns out to be not the end of the world and the world continues for another 100 or 200 or 300 years before the Lord, Lord returns. So for the glory of Jesus, for the honor of Jesus, for the praise of Jesus, out of our love for Jesus, let's not become doom, doomsday preachers. And secondly, why do people become Muslim though Muhammad was a white racist owner of black slaves? Because they're ignorant of what their sources teach. And some of them, when they're confronted by these sources, don't necessarily give up in Islam. They simply reject the Hadith and become Quran-only Muslims. Hmm. Right? But excellent questions. Do you have another question, brother? Uh, I mean, I wanted to ask you something else. Good. I'm pretty sure it's probably going to come. But go me. ask me. No, until people ask me. Guys, you can call in your questions or type them in, in the comments section. I'm looking. So what's your other question, brother? Uh, the, the other question um, that I want to talk about is you were talking, I mean, it's on topic now where you're talking about homosexuality. Yes. And I see it. There's, um, I see it. There's a lot of hypocrisy in, um, um, the, you know, I'm not going against the Christian church now. I'm a Christian myself, yes, yes. but there's a lot of Christian Christians that are accepting um, homosexuality in the churches nowadays. And even pastors are claiming to be homosexual. And they're saying that the New Testament did not um, preach against um, homosexuality. I've seen it a lot. Yeah, and they've been refuted thoroughly, right? I mean, you have people, uh, myself included, and I'm not putting myself on their level of a Michael Brown or uh, James White or even Robert Gagnon, who's the leading voice in refuting this shameless butchering of the Bible claiming that the Bible, specific New Testament, does not condemn homosexual behavior. Actually, it does. But, yeah, but like I said, a man who wants to justify his or her lifestyle will pervert the scriptures to their shame and destruction. It's not just with the issue of homosexuality, brother. You see the cults doing that basically with every belief or practice that goes against the historic Christian faith. For example, People will pervert the Bible to say that the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus is God, that he's a creature or a human prophet. Do you believe that? Jesus Christ is God Almighty. Yeah, but they'll say, no, the Bible doesn't teach that. Do you believe that? Of course not, right? No. Any more than I believe that the New Testament doesn't condemn homosexuality. But let's go with it. Let's just assume, for argument's sake, the New Testament doesn't come out explicitly black and white and say homosexual behavior is a sin, an abomination to God. You need to repent. The Bible doesn't need to spell out everything in black and white because the New Testament, when I say Bible, let me be more specific as the Holy Spirit guides me to speak clearly for the glory of Jesus without error. As you can see, I keep invoking the Holy Spirit's grace and power because we need the Holy Spirit to be qualified teachers speaking the truth for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, the New Testament doesn't need to come out black and white and condemn certain behaviors because the New Testament is built on the foundation of the Old Testament and presupposes the moral code, the sexual ethics of the Old Testament. For example, brother, show me in the New Testament where it says it's sinful for me to have sex with my biological sister. Oh, it's the, it's in the Old Testament. It's not in New no, Testament. no, no, New Testament, brother. Don't go to Old Testament. Put it aside. Can you um, do in, in the New Testament, I guess you could use uh, when it says um, uh, husband of one wife. I don't know. No, you can't. <laughs> Show me in the New Testament. Show me the New Testament where it says it's sinful to sleep with my dog. Bestiality. It's not in the New Testament. Oh, but hold on. If it's not in the New Testament, that means the New Testament doesn't condemn it. It actually condones it. That's the logic of these Bible perverts. But you see, you see, that's that's a good point. What you're saying, but a lot of Christians nowadays, when you say stuff like that, they're gonna be like, if you use it, if you quote the Old Testament, they're gonna say, 
well, the Old Testament is done away with. We don't no, need to go back no, to the no, Old no, Testament. No, 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 no. I already know that, Kennard. Who said it's done away with? The Old Testament has been fulfilled and completed by Jesus Christ. So we look to Jesus <clears throat> and see how he implemented the Old Testament, how he fulfilled the Old Testament, and the New Testament becomes the lens to see which aspects of those commands have been fulfilled in Jesus in such a way that we don't carry out the letter of those commands, but the spirit behind them, and which aspects of those commands are still binding upon us in the New Testament context. So it is not true that the Old Testament has been done away with if you mean that there's nothing in the Old Testament still binding upon Christians under the new covenant of Jesus Christ. That shows an ignorance of how the New Testament handles the Old Testament and interprets it. So no, that's not true. So that's my response to them. So if you're speaking to, uh, uh, on their behalf, that's my response to them. So, But if they're not here to then engage me so I can then continue the refutation. You can understand it, but that's what I'm telling you. That's the response. Who told you the Old Testament has been completely done away with? Where'd you get that from? No, I mean, I mean um, when I was speaking to a, a Christian um, in New, I mean, I'm in New York. When I speak to Christian in, Christians in New York, some of them, not all of them, yeah. not all, but um, they usually say that you know Jesus Christ done away the Old Testament, and that's not yeah, really but what the Bible my says. brother. My answer to them, I don't know if you've answered. Who told you it's done away with? That's my answer to them. Have you told them that? Uh, no, I haven't told them that. Start and then tell me what the response is, because I can't answer an hypothetical objection to that statement unless you've heard and response from them. Who okay, told you it's been a done away say, with? Sorry. No, no, go ahead. Who told you it's been done away with? They usually they usually say that. Um, what do they say? That Jesus. Um, what does they say? Was it they quote that when Jesus when it when they said it is done when Jesus Christ? What has that got to do with the Old Testament exactly. application in the New that. Testament context? It is done meaning that the redemption of sinners <clears throat> has been accomplished. It is done, meaning, if that's what they're referring to, John 19.30, it is finished. It's in the context of Jesus accomplishing the redemption of sinners. He has perfectly accomplished our redemption. The work of redemption is done. It's complete in the life and death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I don't know what they're referring to besides that statement, right? It is done. It is finished. That's John 19.30. So what other passage would they have in mind? If they're referring to Matthew 5, 17, 18, that actually backfires against them because Jesus said, do not think I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, destroy, but fulfill. Truly I say to you, amen, I say to you, not one jot, not one tittle for, will disappear from the law and prophets until all things are accomplished, fulfilled. So the Old Testament is not done away with. It's fulfilled, completed, perfected, finished by Jesus Christ. So now Jesus and his inspired emissaries, meaning the New Testament. The New Testament is Jesus' revelation through his inspired emissaries <clears throat> for the church to use as a lens to now go back into the Old Testament to see what commandments <clears throat> of the Old Testament have been fulfilled in Jesus in such a way where I don't carry out the letter of that command, but the spirit behind that command, and what commandments are still binding as they are <clears throat> stated in the Old Testament. Let me give you an example of what I mean so you understand my point. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3. Ephesians 6, verses 1 to 3. First and last, if you can post it. Good questions, by the way. I enjoy your questions. I'm going to do another session after this, God willing, if you're up for it, because now we're quarantined. We're stuck in the house. Now let's use every second, every minute to worship Jesus, to love Jesus, to trust Jesus, to sing to Jesus, and teach. I'm excited. All right. Ephesians 6, 1 to 3, brother. He posted it in the... Comment section. Let's read what Paul said. Children, this is New Testament now, long after Jesus went to heaven. Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it might be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. He just quoted the Decalogue, one of the commands of the Ten Commandments, which says, Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. But hold on, Paul. The Old Testament's done away with. Why are you still quoting it? Paul, what's wrong with you? Why are you quoting the Old Testament, Paul? So my point is, even if the New Testament didn't have an explicit condemnation of homosexual behavior, and it does, Romans 1, if you read it carefully and honestly and not pervert it to make it say something it isn't saying, 
Romans 1, you read from 18 to 32. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11, and 1 Timothy 1, 10, clearly condemn homosexual behavior as an abomination that you need to repent of. Otherwise, you will not see the kingdom of God. In fact, the New Testament makes it even more explicit than the Old Testament because in the Old Testament, it says, a man should not lie down with a man as he does with a woman. But it doesn't say anything about women lying down with women. And there's a reason for that, and I don't have the time to unpack it. But Paul comes out and says it, black and white. Women gave up the natural use for unnatural ones, meaning instead of desiring men and cohabiting with men, they started cohabiting with one another. A blanket condemnation of lesbianism in Romans 126 with such clarity that it's not found in the Old Testament. So where are they coming up with this stuff? What about 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy. And what about 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy 3. What, what about it? Say? That does that um, also talk against homosexual? Yeah, well, no. Second Timothy three says all the scriptures are breathed out by God. That would include old and new testaments, but it's it's not just Old Testament; it's old and new testaments. Meaning, again, the key hermeneutical principle method of interpreting the Old Testament is the New Testament. You cannot interpret the Old Testament apart from the New Testament because the New Testament is the lens that Jesus has given you, a Christian. To understand the Old Testament and how to live it out and apply it in your life as a Christian. Once you do that, then you're going to know. All right, for example, circumcision is not binding on male Gentiles because physical circumcision pointed to a greater reality. The need for spiritual circumcision, the need to be born again, born anew, to become a new creation. And guess what? That's what water baptism points to. So circumcision pointed to the new creation, but now in the New Testament, it's not physical circumcision for males eight days old. It's now water baptism. You see my point? So here we have a command in which the letter is not carried out, but the spirit behind that command is still carried out in the New Testament. That's my point. Okay. So unless you okay. have something in the New Testament to show, homosexuality was condemned for this reason, but now in the New Testament... If you perform homosexuality for another reason, it's acceptable, it's permissible behavior. Where? Where? So, but anyway, I hope I think I've addressed that full, uh, fully and thoroughly. Do you have another question? Uh, I, I just want to say um, that was a that was a great explanation. Um, I, I Everything good is from the Lord, brother. Everything good is from the Lord. He gets the glory. Thank you. I, I quoted Second Timothy three, but that's actually not what I was. Trying to, uh, I think I was talking about when it says, um, the man shall be lover of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, kind, and all. I, I think it's oh, you're talking about second Timothy. Timothy. Oh, yeah, verses one all the way to nine. Yeah, it's not about the signs of the falling away and the ushering in of Jesus Christ. Yes, but now that's not as explicit as first Timothy 1 10, first Corinthians 6 9 to 11, and Romans 1 26 to 28. But you, you got it there, and also I recommend perusing the books. Articles and videos of Robert Robert Gagnon, G-A-G-N-O-N. He is the leading evangelical voice on the Bible condemning, in no uncertain terms, homosexual lesbian relationships. And he's debated their best representatives, and he's refuted them because it's simply a lie from hell to say the Bible does not condemn homosexuality, lesbianism as immoral sexual acts that are perverted and go against the nature of things. So look into Robert Gagnon, right? All right. G A G N O N. I'm a, I'm a, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I know someone probably trying to call. Yeah, someone asked you, but go on, last question. question. And I'm gonna hang up, and I'm gonna leave, and you won't see me no more. No, it's okay, brother. <laughs> I'm here for you guys, but I gotta be sensitive to others as well. So because you asked three questions, the other guy's gonna have to ask three questions, and then I'm gonna retire and go live in a mo monastery. But go ahead, brother. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, hopefully these questions don't get you banned because you know how it is nowadays. Uh, I'll get banned eventually. <laughs> don't worry, about, it's going to happen. About abortion. Yes. Uh, I know that there's, uh, I don't know which scripture, but there's a, there's a, a, a pagan god called Moloch. Moloch. Yes. You'll find yeah. in Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, it mentions offerings. But see, that's not necessarily abortion because abortion is murdering the human life in the womb. These babies were not in the womb. They were born and offered as a sacrifice to Moloch. If you're asking for 
verses in which you can see that the unborn child is a human life that has human dignity and therefore to kill the child in the woman's murder. There are passages that teach that. So really? Yes. Exodus 21. Write these down. Exodus 21, 22 to 25. Read it carefully because there it talks about a woman. If two men have, are in an altercation, Exodus 21, 22, 25, and she's pregnant. And then the woman gets struck in the alt altercation. The baby is born prematurely. If the baby dies, the man is to be put yeah. to death. But if the baby suffers damage, then the man will be punished accordingly. It's Exodus 21, 22 to 25. Now, people try to get around it saying, no, damage to the woman. No, it's not damage to the woman. It's damage to the unborn baby. You know how I know? It's a damage to the unborn baby? No. Because if it's about the woman, why even mention a pregnant woman? Why not just mention women in general? Because if a woman's <laughs> not pregnant, if she gets struck, so then that means no punishment. For the person who struck her? See, that just tells you how desperate these Bible perverts, perverts and sons of the devil are. The reason why Exodus 21, 22 to 25 mentions a pregnant woman because it's focusing on the unborn child. If it was a statement about the woman suffering, why even mention a pregnant woman? Why not just mention a woman in general? Mm. Right? Anyway, Sam, thank you so much. Thank you. And then I'm finally, ready. final one for you. Final one for you. I want you to read Luke 1 carefully and specifically Luke 1, 41 to 45, because there you'll see Jesus has just been conceived in the womb of his blessed mother, maybe a week old. She just conceived him. John is six months old in his mother's womb. He's still in his mother's womb six months, right? Was, would this be considered the second trimester or third? I don't know. But anyway, because I don't know too much about medical jargon. Anyway. John is six months old in his mother's womb. Jesus has just been conceived. When Mary walks in, John hears the voice of Mary, and he's filled with the Holy Spirit, and he leaps for joy, responds to the voice of Mary in the womb, leaps for joy, showing you that's a human life that can experience emotions such as elation. And Elizabeth says that Mary is the mother of my Lord, but Jesus had just been conceived. He was only a week old at the very least. And yet he's still Elizabeth's Lord because he's a human life in the womb, just like John is a life in the womb. Luke 1, 41 to 45. Uh, I'm reading it right now. Wow, this is amazing. All right. So if you have eyes to see and ears to, see, ears to hear by the power of the Holy Spirit and you're allowing the Bible to speak and not perverting the Bible and trust the Holy Spirit to illuminate you, Abortion is murder in the eyes of God, and God will damn all murderers of unborn babies. Okay? Wow. If you don't repent. But anyway, I hope Amazing. that answered your question. All right. Thank you, Sam. God bless you, brother. Okay, now we have someone else. Cho, is it? Uh, hip Cho. Oh, Hip Chow. Call me, bro. And if you have questions, ask me in the text. Come on, hip chow. Where are you at, bro? You said you wanted to call. If not, I'm going to take questions in the text. I guess hip chow got scared. What's up, bro? Man, Dale, brother, I just saw your picture, Dale. You're a good-looking brother, man. Different brother from a different mother. What's up, hip chow? Hip chow, what's up, man? Oh, sorry. Call me again, bro. Call me again. I'll call you. How about that? Don't be scared. It's not working. Why is it? I'm calling you. It's not working. This year, hip child before the rapture. All right. Okay. David Julius, were you trying to call me? DJ Julius. Okay. Any other questions in the text? Because people are afraid to call me. These were excellent questions. Hello. Who is it? Oh, my goodness. Why do I keep hanging up on this guy by accident? Because I'm very stupid, Andy. You there? Am I calling the wrong number? Sorry about that. Hello? Hi, Hip Chow. 
I'm sorry. I, I couldn't figure out my Skype. I couldn't figure out either. It's okay. What's happening, Hip Chow? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just think. It's just not. It's just a general question. Go ahead. What? Well, hold okay. on. Before you ask me the general question, let me look for the general. Let me call the army and ask for the general. Hey, general. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm um, just wondering, like, um, what do you do with uh, Muslims who just uh, don't accept any hadith or any Quran passages they don't like? They always fall on. Or oh, you, you have to look at the context and it's historical, blah, yeah. blah, blah. And um, they just... And then they they like oh no that's Wahhabism and we don't adhere to Wahhabism. Yeah. What do you say? Well, I don't know because I don't know what question I'm responding to because he first said oh that's Wahhabism. So yeah. and then he said oh we don't accept the hadith oh but not that hadith. So which which group the ones who reject the hadith completely or what what? Because those are three different groups in your question. One group that says no hadith. One group that says no some hadith. And one group that says, no, that's the Wahhabi interpretation. So that's three different questions. Which one do you want me to answer? Uh, maybe the Wahhabism one. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, Wahhabism, it's actually simply another name for those Muslims who call themselves Salafi, right? Salafi. You know why they're called okay. Salafi? Why? Because they'll sell you for a fee. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All right. Salafi, <laughs> they'll sell you for a fee. No, but, and then I have to, you know, I got to bring this joke in. You remember yeah. the Pharisees of Jesus' day? Yeah. You know why they were Pharisees? Why? Yeah, yeah, I know why they're Pharisees, yeah. Why? Because uh, they're too legalistic? No, because you mean? no, because they're fair, you see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then. And not like that. Oh, and the Sadducees, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. So they were sad, you see. But the Pharisees <laughs> believed in the resurrection, so they were fair, you see. And the Salafis will sell you for a fee. It's your birthday. See, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian, but sitting down. But now, coming to your question. Okay, yeah. coming to your question. Those Muslims who tell you, well, this is the Wahhabi interpretation of the Quran and the Hadith, usually are Muslims who are ignorant of what the Quran and the Hadith teach. So I would say, okay, let's put them aside. Let's ignore them. I don't want their interpretation. Let's just look at the verses of the Quran and then look to the Hadith for their historical context. So you need to then demonstrate that the hadiths and even the Sira literature interpret these passages in the Quran in the same exact way that the Wahhabis or ICE or <clears throat> Al-Qaeda interpret them. So say, forget them. I'm not getting my interpretation from them. I'm reading chapter 9, verse 29. Fight those who yeah. do not believe in Allah, <clears throat> nor his messenger, nor believe... <clears throat> I'm sorry, fight those who don't believe in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid yeah. what Allah and his messenger forbid, nor embrace the religion of the truth, even if they're people of the book until they pay the jizya. Okay, now this statement says fight them because of their unbelief. It doesn't say fight them because they attack Muslims, they were antagonistic, they oppress Muslims. It says fight them because of their unbelief. So if yeah. I just go with the Quran, the Quran is telling you, you need to fight me, a non-Muslim, because I reject your Allah, I reject your view of the last day, the day of judgment and Jannah paradise, which is a glorified playboy mansion. And I reject yeah. what Muhammad tells me to do and what to do. So it says, fight me. Fight me because of my rejection of the so-called truth of Islam. It doesn't say fight me because I attacked you. It doesn't say fight me because I oppressed you. They'll say, oh, but let's look at the historical context. Hey, even better. I look at the historical context and it reinforces the fact this command was given to justify Muhammad's attack on Byzantine Christians whom he threatened that if they didn't embrace Islam, then they would suffer yeah. the consequences. So how is the interpretation of Wahhabis incorrect? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Did you hear that noise in the background? <laughs> that noise, your noise in the background. Did you hear that? The roar, roar, you know that was? What? You have a jinn in your house. That's an angry jinn. Be careful. Because when I attacked Islam, the gen went. Rrr, rrr, rrr. <laughs> it's okay. I'll just tell them your three jokes and they'll run away. <laughs> Is that how bad I am? But go ahead. What's your other question, sister? Feel free to ask me. Well, so what if someone, a Muslim, like this is a real example, and she said that um, 
She feels peace when she recites the verses, and she feels like she she feels like she talks to God directly when she sure prays and recites the verses. Yes. So how do you counter that? Very easy. That's purely subjective, and you have a satanic <clears throat> realm in which mm -hmm. Satan and evil spirits will give you a false sense of peace and joy in order to deceive you from the true God. I'm going to give you biblical verses to prove this. But before I do that, I say, okay, Mormons tell me they feel peace when they read the Book of Mormon, and they even pray to God for this burning sensation in their bosom, which is the sign whether Mormonism is true or not, and they get that burning sensation in their bosom. So does that mean Mormonism is true? Because they're telling no. me they feel good, and they ask God because there is a test. It's in their, their sources that says, if you want to know this is true, Ask for a burning sensation in your bosom, the burning in the bosom. And many will say, when we prayed, we felt that burning sensation in the bosom. And therefore, Mormonism is true. Would you then say that they are on the true path? Because to them, God the Father was a man who became God. So he has a God over him. God the Father has, sp uh, has spirit wives that he has sex with, and he gets them pregnant. Jesus and okay. Satan... Are some of his children and their brothers. So does that mean Mormonism is true? It contradicts Islam. She'll say no. So then why do you assume just because it makes you feel good that somehow that means it's true? There are people who shoot up heroin and makes them feel good. There are people who get drunk and it makes them feel good. There are people <clears throat> who do a lot of things that we know are bad and destructive, but it makes them feel good, right? Yeah. Well, I actually brought up an example with Buddhists who are meditating and they, and they feel, feel peace. Good. Yes. And then she, and then she said that, well, this is my private affair. I feel peace. Therefore, I think it's true. And I don't okay, want to listen you can't to you. Should her. I give up at that point? Yeah, you what? can't. You're now forcing her to want to be a Christian. No, leave her be. But now for you, for your benefit and the benefit of everyone else, I'm going to show you from Scripture, from the Bible, yeah. because it's God's word, that Satan is in the business of deceiving people by giving them a false sense of peace and joy and fulfillment. But because it's false, it's only temporary. It's inevitable that that path won't be able to truly satisfy them unless they've reached the point of reprobation where they have grieved the Holy Spirit to such an extent that the Holy Spirit is now <clears throat> fed up with them and will hand them over to the desires of their heart. So let me repeat this again. Yeah, yeah, please. Let me, I got to repeat because uh, there's a lot of meat here, and I'm trusting the Spirit to guide me to speak clearly. Because, again, I need the Holy Spirit to make sure I interpret scriptures correctly for the glory of Jesus. And I mean that. I don't just say that to say that. Now, can I hang up now or what? No, you can listen. If you want to hang up, that's up to you. If you have no more questions, that's up to you. Feel free. You can stick around. But let me explain how it works. Satan can only give you a false sense of peace and joy and fulfillment that cannot last because it's false. It's not true. It's not anchored in the God of truth, the ultimate reality, the source of all true peace and joy and fulfillment, God. Now, with that said, however, if a person has resisted the Holy Spirit and grieved the Holy Spirit and has reached the point of no return, then what happens is the Holy Spirit then hands them over to the desires of their heart because that's now the judgment that's fallen upon them because of their willful neglect or oppression, suppression, defiance of the work of the Holy Spirit in their hearts to bring them to the truth. Now, let me show you biblical basis for what I said. Does Satan give people a false sense of peace, a false sense of fulfillment, deceives them into thinking that they're on the path of righteousness in order to keep them away from the true path? Absolutely. First of all, you'll find it taught by the Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11, as well as in Galatians 1. Now, let me show you what he says in Galatians 1. Galatians chapter 1, verses 8 to 9. Galatians 1, verses 8 to 9. Watch here. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that he have received, let him be a curse. So Paul is warning that even if an angel shows up and te teaches another gospel, may that angel be condemned to hell. So here, the implication of what Paul is saying is there are angels that are fallen angels, evil spirits, that will masquerade as righteous angels, 
and will present a message of truth, quote unquote, the good news of salvation, quote unquote, to deceive you from the true message of salvation, the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And then Paul makes this explicit in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 15. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 15. I don't know what forever means when he says the I am of the Old Testament. Because I think that's calling for a block. Now read this. I'm going to read this for you, sister. For such are false apostles. Paul is talking about false apostles who claim to be true apostles. Deceitful workers. They're workers of deceit who deceive you into thinking they are true spokespersons of Christ. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So notice what Paul says. One of the greatest tricks of Satan is to appear as an angel of light, a righteous angel, and empower his ministers, his servants, to give the appearance of being righteous, holy, pious servants, full of peace and joy and contentment in order to dupe you and to wanting that peace and joy and fulfillment and follow them on their path of destruction. It's right there. So why would we be surprised that a Mormon prays, God, if the Book of Mormon is true, let me feel this burning in my bosom. And bam, he feels a burning in his bosom. That's not because the true God is hearing him. It's because Satan is trying to create that sensation in his bosom to convince him this is the true path. The path of ultimate joy and fulfillment and peace. Stay on this path because the end of it is destruction. And that's what Satan wants. He's a deceiver. He's a trickster. He's a liar. He's a conniver. He'll appear in a form that will delight your heart. He'll appear the, the way you want him to appear in order to mislead you into this path of destruction. Satan will be what you want him to be if he can then hook his claws into you and damn you to hell. Because he doesn't care whether you believe in him or not. He doesn't care whether you're, not whether you're religious or not. He doesn't care if you want to be religious, if you want to be atheist. He doesn't care. What he cares is that you do not discover the true God, the true Christ, receive the true spirit, and hear the true gospel. You want to be a Buddhist? Sure. You want to be a Jehovah's Witness? Hey. You want to be Mormon, Muslim? Anything you want. I'll be anything you want. I'll appear in any form you want. I'll give you what you want as long as you don't come to the true Jesus. That's that's the biblical message. Now, with that said, let me show you the danger in that if someone whom God has reached out to by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit raising people to preach that person, to give that person convincing proofs that this is the gospel of salvation, that Jesus is the God man, your only hope of salvation. But that person keeps rejecting it. And keeps rejecting it and keeps <clears throat> fighting against it and keeps suppressing it because he or she is content with the way he or she is living and don't want to be accountable to Christ or follow this path, this religion, because <clears throat> it may cost them their relationships. It may cost them their jobs. It may cost them their enjoyment because a lot of people don't want to turn Christ to Christ because they don't want to give up and their immoral behavior. Let's just put it out there. There are people who know the gospel is true, who know the Bible is true, who know Jesus is Lord, but they don't want to submit to the lordship of Christ because they're enjoying their lifestyle. They're enjoying having sex before marriage and they don't want to give it up. They're enjoying cheating the government or cheating their employees or cheating, you name it, because it's allowing them to make the money they want to make, to buy the home that they want to buy, and get the cars that they want to want to drive. So they'd rather do this and indulge in their pleasure than submit to Christ and carry their cross and deny themselves. And so what does God say to those people who continue in this path of defiance and disobedience? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 to 12. And the reason why I mention these so-called Christians is because I know many of them. I know people who tell you Jesus, son of God, the Bible is true, but they refuse to submit to the Lordship of Christ because they can't give up on their gambling. They can't give up on their drugs. 
They can't give up getting drunk. They can't give up of having premarital sex or adulterous relationships. They can't give up, won't give up because they enjoy it too much. And they can't imagine living a life without these sinful passions and pleasures, though they are temporary. I know people like that personally. So I'm, that's why I mentioned it. It's not just Muslims who don't want to accept the gospel. There are people who claim to be Christian and know the gospel true and still don't want to accept it. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 to 12. The danger with such an individual, he or she may reach a point where God then says, enough. I've given you ample proof, <clears throat> ample evidence to leave you with no excuse to continue to reject the gospel. But now you keep suppressing the truth. You've reached the point of no return and my spirit will have no more dealings with you. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. What does it say about these individuals? Pay attention. To the context of satanic deception again. A satanic deceit. Foisted through the Antichrist. Where the Antichrist will be empowered by Satan. To do miracles. Signs and wonders. To deceive those who perish. Why? Giving them what they want. And they perish. And believe the lie of Satan. Because they don't know it's Satan. Working through the Antichrist. So why do they perish? Let's read. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 to 12. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, empowered by Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, deceiving you into a path of unrighteousness that you justify and try to pass off as being something that is right, something that's not wrong. Hey, why is it a sin for me to have sex before marriage with women? What's, what's wrong with that? It's two consenting adults. Why should God care? Why should that be a problem? Or why is it a sin? I'm in love with this man and I'm committed to him in a monogamous relationship. Why should that be a problem? What's wrong with that? See, the deceivableness of unrighteousness. Unrighteous behaviors that they justify and try to pass off as nothing wrong, nothing sinful with such actions, such behaviors. What happens to them? Deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why do they perish? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, this reason, because they don't love the truth. They don't want the truth. Right? For this reason, for this cause, right? <clears throat> God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, why would God do that? Why would God allow them to be deceived and deluded to believe a lie? Here it is, verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There you go, sister. So there are people who are happy and content in their lifestyle or their religion. Because yeah. Satan will make you happy and content for a short while. Because he wants to keep you away from the true God, the true Christ, the true spirit, and the true gospel. Now, the Holy Spirit's work is to then convict you. To show you that this lifestyle isn't truly fulfilling and cannot satisfy. And the end result is destruction. But if you keep resisting the spirit and suppressing the revelation of the spirit, then you reach a point in which the Holy Spirit says, okay, let me hand you over to your desires. Mm. And that's dangerous if you reach that point. Um, that, that leads me to uh, one of my questions. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Hebrews 6 and 10. Yes, yeah, 6, really 4 to 6. Can, can you explain that? You mean or? Hebrews 6, 4 to 6? Uh, the one where it says like... It's you impossible know, to restore them to repentance? Yeah, about that like you yeah. can't be... Yeah, that's, is, that's a difficult passage, sister, because it's difficult how to interpret that passage in the context of Hebrews. Is Hebrews talking about those who are truly born again, who can be cut off and it's impossible to restore them? Or is it a yeah. hypothetical situation? Where if someone who's truly born of the Spirit were to be cut off, it's over for him. But it's not possible for someone who's truly born of the Spirit to be cut off <clears throat> where what he or it? she can never return. That's the debate, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I can give you one perspective of how to interpret that passage, but I have to be clear. This is one perspective. Others would disagree with this perspective and say that's not what Hebrews is teaching. Folks, let me show you the passage he's referring to, and we can talk about that. So far, are you guys with me? Or did I put you to okay. sleep with these answers? Okay, thank you. I'm going to hang okay, up. Okay, and I'll answer to you. I'll answer. I'll answer. Okay. 
Okay, oh, thank you. Know. Okay. Bye. Everyone with me so far, you enjoying this? Is it blessing you? Is it stretching you? Is it edifying you? Is it also causing you to be blown away with the depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture, and how the Bible literally has the answers for everything, even if you don't like those answers? And trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me to interpret these passages correctly for the glory of Jesus Christ. So you've been blessed so far? All right. This is the passage he's referring to. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. This is what she's referring to. Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6. Let's read. Read with me. This is what she's referring to. For it is impossible, notice, impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Impossible for someone who partook of the Holy Spirit, had fellowship with the Holy Spirit, Tasted the heavenly gifts from the Holy Spirit. Impossible for that person, having tasted the good word of God and seen the powers of the world to come, right? What the world to come will be by seeing the work of the Holy Spirit and transforming the lives of sinners and making them saints. He saw what the world to come will be in the transformed lives of sinners made saints. It's impossible for that person, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Now, this is what she's asking me. Is this passage saying there are people who are truly born again who can be cut off from the Spirit if they turn away from Christ and deny Christ so that those individuals can never be restored and repent ever again? Or, or is it saying... That believers who are born of the Spirit, if they could turn away and be cut off, if they could turn away and be cut off, impossible for them to ever be forgiven. But that's the point. It's not possible for true believers to be cut off indefinitely. It's not possible for someone who's truly born of the Spirit to turn away and be cut off, never to be restored again. If it were possible, then it's over for them. But thank God it's not possible. So which interpretation makes sense of the context of Hebrews? Let me repeat the two possible interpretations. Follow with me, guys. Two possible interpretations. It can be referring to someone who's truly born of the Spirit, turning away from Christ, being cut off from Christ, and never, ever being forgiven again. Because it says it's impossible. Or it could be referring to a hypothetical situation. If it were to take place where someone born of the spirit turns away from Christ and denies Christ and is cut off from Christ. If that could happen, then that person could never be forgiven again. But thank the Lord, it can't happen. Now, why am I saying that it may be hypothetical? There are two possible interpretations. Let me give you something similar. Let's go to Matthew 24, verses 23 to 24. I'm going to give you what I believe to be the interpretation. There are people who disagree with me. If you're one of them, that's okay. We can agree to disagree. Let's not beat each other and condemn each other as heretics. I'm going to give you what I believe this passage means in the context of Hebrews. Now, read Matthew 24, 23 to 24. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. See, if it were possible, even the elect would be deceived to worship a false Christ or follow a false prophet. Thank God it's not possible. Right? But the miracles and the signs will be so powerful, so convincing, that the elect would even be deceived into following a false Christ or a false prophet if it were possible. But thank the triune God, it's not possible, so they won't fall after a false Christ or believe a false prophet. Everyone with me so far? Everyone with me so far with the two possible <clears throat> interpretations of Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6? Okay? So, let me repeat the two possible interpretations. One, Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 can be referring to someone who is truly born again, turns away from Christ, is now severed from Christ, so that person can never be restored and forgiven again. He remains condemned. He goes to hell. 
That's one interpretation. The second interpretation says this is a hypothetical situation. The author is saying if someone was born of the spirit and he turned away from Christ and it's cut off, if that were to happen, that person can never be restored. It's impossible. But thank God that can't happen if he's truly a believer. Now, I obviously believe the second interpretation is more correct. Now, can I give you my reasons why? Why do I think the second interpretation, that it's hypothetical, not actual? Because if someone is truly born of the Spirit, he or she can never be cut off from Christ indefinitely and permanently. Why do I believe that? You may disagree with me. It's okay. Let's look at the context. Let's read Hebrews 6, 7 to 8. Hebrews 6, 7 to 8. Excellent questions today. Really good. Hebrews 6, 7 to 8. Now, guys, please read and pay attention. Okay? Now, this is right after verse 6. So this is the same context, folks. Read. For the earth which drinketh the rain that cometh oft up and, uh, upon it, the earth that drinks the rain, right, that comes upon it, right, bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, bring forth fruits, vegetables, right, receiving blessing from God. That's the earth that takes in the water. But now notice the other, eight. But that which beareth thorns and briefs is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So here we have two soils. One soil that takes in the water, which is a metaphor for the Holy Spirit, and it is fruitful. The other that's burned doesn't take in the water. It only produces, right, thorns and briars, meaning that soil was never saved. That soil was never good. In contrast to the soil that was good and took in the Holy Spirit. So who gets burned up? Who gets dest destroyed? The heart that is hardened, hardened soil that doesn't take in the rain, that doesn't take in the Holy Spirit. They're the ones that are cut off and destroyed because they were never saved and never truly of the Lord. No, that's not a third option, well mean. Well mean, do not pontificate and chime in, so I have to correct you. No. Tasting the Holy Spirit means actually <clears throat> being in fellowship and union with the Holy Spirit. That's not the third option unless you want to get a third block. Let me correct your misinterpretation. The word partake means a genuine, actual communion and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. That same word is used in Hebrews 2.14 where it says Jesus partook of flesh and blood. He actually became flesh and blood. So those who partook the Holy Spirit actually were united to the Spirit, born of the Spirit. Don't chime in and start a debate, brother. That's why I said there's only two interpretations. You can insist on a third one. That means you're now perverting the Scripture. And if you're okay with that, you'll answer to the Lord. Don't chime in. Please. Okay, block. No, no. Blow, blow. Your wish is my command. Okay, no, 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 no. Block. Don't block. I thought no, no was serious. Don't block. No, no, don't tempt me because I'll give you what you want. I just said don't block. All right. This is what happens when you guys chime in and pontif pontificate. Stop being a chief. Be an Indian. Don't distract me. Focus. That was Hebrews 6, 7, 8. Now let's read Hebrews 6, 9 to 10. Hebrews 6, 9 to 10. Hebrews 6, 9 to 10. Read with me. Yahi. But beloved, we are persuade, persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Did you catch the same context? For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. Let's look at Hebrews 6, 9 to 10 one more time. Guys, notice what he goes on to say. But beloved, we're convinced of better things of you. You're not those who are solid surface that only produce thorns and briars. No, you are of the saved, right? You will be saved, right? Here, Hebrews 6, 9 and 10. So in the same context, the author clearly states, you are believers, you have received salvation, right? And our opinion of you is that you will endure and be saved. 
And God is not unjust to forget your good deeds so that you don't need to worry, right? This is the context, Hebrews 6, 7 to 10. So the immediate context shows me that it must be hypothetical because those who are truly born of the Spirit will not turn away indefinitely and be cut off indefinitely because God is faithful to work in them in such a way and convict them in such a way that if they do fall for a season, they'll be restored and repent so that it's impossible for them to be cut off indefinitely because they are the earth that has taken in the water, the Holy Spirit, and are producing fruits unlike that soil that only produces thorns and briars and is to be burned up. Clear so far? Is that clear so far? Because I got more verses from Hebrews. I'm not done yet. I got more verses from Hebrews, right? Hebrews 10, verse 10 and 14 to 17. Hebrews 10, verse 10 and 14 to 17. Let me finish this question. We'll go into other things. Hebrews 10, verse 10 and 14 to 17. By the which we will... We, we, by the which... Will we are sanctified by the will of Christ. We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now notice 14. For by one offering, Jesus, by one sacrifice, has perfected, made you complete for some time or forever. He has perfected and made you complete forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Did you see what it says about those whom Christ has perfected forever, completed forever, sanctified, set apart from sin, set them apart to be his? It says he's perfected you forever so that God will never count your sins against you anymore. If you're not reading the passages and following me, then you're not going to get why I believe the second interpretation is correct. The second interpretation that this is hypothetical, not actual. Someone born of the Spirit, transformed by the Spirit, who's produced fruits of the Spirit, whom Christ has set apart and perfected forever, that person cannot be cut off indefinitely so that that person can never be restored to Christ. Because you just read, those whom Christ has set apart, he's perfected forever so that God will never count their sins against them ever again. Is everyone with me so far or am I losing you guys? That was Hebrews 10, verse 10 and 14 and 17. Hebrews 10, 39. Hebrews 10, 39. Hebrews 10, 39. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Ah, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We are not of those who turn away and reject Christ and end up destroyed. No, we're not them. We are those who endure by faith till the end to receive salvation. Hey, what's up, Liza? It's been a while. I haven't seen you. <laughs> you catch it? Do you guys catch it? What does the author of Hebrews say to those who are born of the Spirit, who trusted in Christ? We are not of them who draw back unto perdition. We don't turn away to be destroyed. That's not us. Hebrews 10, 39. Post it again. But we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Okay, folks. If I interpret Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 in the context of Hebrews then you can make a strong exegetical case that cannot actually happen to someone who's born of the Spirit. Someone born of the Spirit cannot turn back and be cut off indefinitely, never to be restored. Cannot happen. If I interpret Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, in the light of Hebrews as a whole, and not just take snippets out of context, right? Right? Is that clear or no? 
Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. So then who turns away? Who gets cut off from Christ? Who ends up being burnt and destroyed? I'll show you. Hebrews 7, 24 to 25. But this man, Jesus Christ, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost, save you completely and perfectly and forever that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So here we're told that Jesus saves us who believe in him, who believe in God because of him. He saves us completely, forever, to the uttermost. And he's always interceding for us and preserving us by his spirit. And by one sacrifice, he set you apart and perfected you forever. Right? So then who is it that turns away? Who is it that is cut off from Christ? Those who don't truly believe. Those who have a said faith that's a dead faith, not a faith produced by the Spirit, where they've absorbed the living water, the Holy Spirit, in their hearts, in their soil, the soil of their heart. Let me show you that. Who turns away? And it's cut off. Hebrews 3, verse 10 and 12 to 13. Hebrews 3, verse 10 and 12 to 13. Liza, what's going on? Did you miss me, sister? It's been a while. She's not on my Facebook page, poor sister. I think I have to go and reconnect with her. Hebrews 3, 10 and 12 to 13. Who turns away, folks? Who's cut off? Pay attention. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always ear in their heart. And they have not known my ways. And so now notice the warning. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So who turns away? Those whose hearts are evil, full of doubts and unbelief, who haven't truly trusted in God and truly know God. They turn away. So if I interpret Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6, in the context of Hebrews as a whole, in, in light of Hebrews 3, in light of Hebrews 6 itself, just reading 7 to 10, in light of Hebrews 7, in light of Hebrews 9, in light of Hebrews 10, then the last thing I'll walk away with is the understanding that Hebrews actually teaches that someone can be truly born of the Spirit and turn away and be destroyed, reject Christ completely, so that person can never be restored. That's not the teaching of Hebrews if I read Hebrews as a whole in context. With me there? Freddie, didn't you read it? Let's try it again. Hebrews 6, 7 to 8. One more time. It's right in front of you. Hebrews 6, 7 to 8. Two types of soils, Freddie. One more time. Let me repeat this again. How much time has it been for this live stream? Should I be wrapping it up? Read again, Freddie. Guys, read. For the earth which drinketh in the rain. See, the earth that does take in the rain. Rain, a metaphor for the Holy Spirit. Takes in the rain. That cometh oft upon it. The rain that's coming con continually on that earth. Bringeth forth herbs, meat for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But, see, that's a different soil. That which bear thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. So it's two different soils. The one that takes in the water repeatedly and bears forth fruit, showing that it's blessed of God. And that which only produces thorns and briars, showing it's a hardened surface that hasn't taken in the rain to be burned. He's still not convinced? Let's repeat the passages one more time. Because remember, we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until we become second nature. One more time. Hebrews 10, verse 10 and 14. Hebrews 10, verse 10 and 14. I'll take one more question. And thank you guys for the super chat, the contribution. Stay strong. Don't panic. Don't lose hope. Don't stop praying. Pray more. Fast more. Sing more praises to God. Study the Bible more. Have more online sessions and fellowship. And continue to give to the work of God. Don't be afraid and don't cut back from the work of God. 
cut back on other things, but not on the work of God and helping those in need that are less fortunate than you. Okay, now Hebrews 10, verse 10 and 14. By the which will we are sanctified. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. We've been set apart from sin, set apart for Christ once and for all. Now notice 14. For by one offering, he, Jesus, hath perfected us, perfected you and me forever, perfected forever them that are sanctified. So if Christ has set you apart, he has perfected you. He has completed you in the sight of God, not for some time, but for all time. And then notice Hebrews 10, 15 to 17. Hebrews 10, 15 to 17. And by the way, first last, those on Discord, are you getting it? Following with me? Maybe daughter of Christ is listening. Are you learning how to interpret Hebrews, how not to interpret Hebrews? Hebrews 10, 15 to 17. Let's read. Hebrews 10, 15 to 17. Whereof the Holy Ghost, even the Holy Spirit, who's God Almighty, who cannot lie, he bears witness to us. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that, he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Now notice, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So folks, let me ask you a question. If you're truly born of the spirit, you've been truly set apart by Christ and Christ has perfected you forever and he saves you to the uttermost completely and forever. And if you're one of those that's been set apart, and the Holy Spirit says, here's my promise to you. I promise to you and I cannot lie. I'll never count your sins against you anymore. How then can you be cut off from Christ, severed from Christ and be destroyed and never be able to repent and return to Christ if these passages are true? So if I responsibly... Interpret Hebrews 6, 4 to 6, meaning interpret Hebrews 6 in light of the immediate context, the chapter itself and the book as a whole. Then the only interpretation that makes sense, it's hypothetical. If it were possible for someone who's truly elect, born of the spirit, sanctified and perfected forever. If it were possible for that one to be cut off from Christ, then there is no more hope of forgiveness and salvation for that person. But thank God. The message of Hebrews is, that's not possible. Thank you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's not possible. Clear? Everyone got it? Let me take a question or two, one more question or two, and then we're done. And guys, should I come back and do a topic, God willing, tonight? Because I got nothing to do but sit home all day because it's a very gloomy, rainy day. There's nowhere to go. So Lord willing, if you want... It's now 5 p.m. my time, which is 7 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time. I can come back around 8.30, 9 p.m. New York time, Eastern Standard Time. An hour and a half, two hours from now and do another session. Do another session. Okay. Anyone? If no one's calling me, you can text me your question. I'll take one or two more questions and we'll call this a wrap. And Lord willing, I'll come back in about two hours to do another session. What's there to explain about 1 John 5, 16 and 17? Okay. Let me take this. Let me take this question. Hafsa for Christ. Let me answer you real quickly. First, ask the Holy Spirit what the gifts <clears throat> happen to be. Ask the Holy Spirit, what are the gifts you've given to me? First, ask. Holy Spirit, show me what are the gifts, because I know you've given me gifts. Pray, and then the Holy Spirit will confirm at the mouth of two or three witnesses. So you first tell the Holy Spirit. Can you show me what your gifts are that I'm to use to glorify Jesus Christ? Secondly, wait then for multiple confirmation. Two or three witnesses will confirm what your gifts are independently from each other. For example, have some. Some will say, hey, you know what? Have you ever thought about maybe being a missionary? And then someone will come later and say, you know what? You'd be a great missionary. See, that's how you know. First, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. And then secondly, wait for the confirmation. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, the Holy Spirit will confirm to you, this is your gift or these are your gifts. Did you get the answer to that, Hapsa? Because that was real quick. Angie, T, 
To say you have no gifts or any, you don't have any gifts, you don't mean this, but let me tell you, you've insulted the Holy Spirit and saying the Holy Spirit is a liar. God forbid, Angie Concrete, you can't mean that and you would never dare say that because the Holy Spirit cannot lie and he has sworn to give gifts to every member of the body of Christ. So either the Spirit lied, which would be blasphemy, or you're not a believer. So are you a believer, Angie? Or you're not a believer, you're a liar. Because the Holy Spirit cannot lie. He's God Almighty. So are you a fake Christian? Okay, Angie. Never, ever, ever say, I have no gifts. Because either that means the Spirit lied. God forbid. The Holy Spirit can never lie. Or you're a liar. You're not a believer. God forbid. You're not a liar. You are a believer. So you have gifts. This shows your lack of faith, Angie. So say, Holy Spirit, destroy my unbelief. Destroy my lack of faith. I know I belong to you. I know you're God. I know you can't lie. I know I have gifts. Show me. And wait and be patient. And he'll show you. Bernie, I'm, I'm suspecting you're dead while you're awake. So why are you asking me, are you dead when you sleep? You're dead right now and you're fully awake. Now, let me answer that question by, was it Sandeep? 1 John 5, 16 to 17. 1 John 5, 16 to 17. Let's post it. This will be the last question for now. Yeah. 1 John 5, 16 to 17. Now, guys, give me your undivided attention because this too has to do with salvation. Can you lose it? Read with me, folks. 1 John 5, 16 and 17. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life. For them that sin not unto death, there's a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin and there's a sin not unto death. Okay, guys, are you ready for me to explain this passage? This is where I need to make sure you're listening. Glory to God. We're up to 175 today. Hopefully we'll keep increasing for the glory of Jesus. All right, you ready? Are you listening? What does this mean? What does it mean that there's a sin that will cause you to die and other sins that won't cause you to die? So if someone commits the sin that causes him or her to die, don't pray for that person. Right? What does that mean? Number one, are you ready now? Because I want to explain it. Number one, what sin does John have in mind? What sin is he referring to? What sin could you possibly commit that will result in your death? We don't know. John doesn't tell us. Anything I say or any other pastor says is conjecture. John nowhere tells us what sin he has in mind that will result in death. Let me repeat it again. Where the Bible is silent, you be silent. Okay, Marion, which part of John doesn't say, so you want me to just make it up? Okay, Marion, suicide. Which part of John doesn't tell us what the sin is that causes you to die. So why are you saying suicide, Marion? Help me understand your logic here. I just said, John doesn't tell us what sin he's referring to that would cause you to die and say, hey, suicide? Here, let's guess. So let me say it again. John doesn't tell us what that sin is, so let's start guessing. He doesn't tell, oh, suicide, oh, murder. Oh, no, maybe eating uh, stuffed pizza. Come on, Marion. You know I love you, sister. You're my sister in the Lord. Come on. I'm an equal opportunist offender. Let's try this again. Folks, help me to help you. Which part of John doesn't tell us what that sin is wasn't clear? The tell us or the sin? That's number one. We are not told what sin would cause someone to die. What sin does John have in mind? So any response or answer will be conjecture. It will be guesswork. Someone will say, well, he's talking about the denial of the incarnation, that if you deny Christ has become in the flesh or that the divine Christ is the same as the human Jesus, that's the sin. Maybe because he does address those sins in that letter, but he doesn't come out and say it. Maybe, maybe not. Is everyone with me? Why do you, why do you think I said you need to pay attention? Pay attention because this is a serious question and I have to answer as honestly as possible because I'm going to give an account to the Holy Spirit how I answer, okay? We don't know what sin John has in mind, 
But secondly, does this passage again assume that if you're truly born of the Spirit and you truly belong to Christ and you're made spiritually alive, that you can then spiritually die again? Is this what this passage is saying? Michelle, God bless you and watch over you. Is John stating that someone who's spiritually alive, born of the Spirit, can then die spiritually? Depending on what Christian you ask, they'll say yes or no. Now, how do I answer the question? Okay. Let me tell you how I answer the question. Are you ready? Let me tell you how I answer the question. Are you ready? Are you ready for the answer? Because I'm also trying to teach you how to interpret the Bible by the grace of God's Spirit, how not to interpret it. Since John wrote the Gospel of John and three letters, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and Revelation, if I want to know the answer, I'll either get my answer by looking at that epistle itself or looking at all of John's writings and study everything John has written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit regarding this subject. Are you with me there? Because I believe, because John is inspired, he will not contradict himself. That what John says in one writing, right, won't be contradicted by something he writes somewhere else. Because John is consistent, in light of the fact that the Holy Spirit is inspiring him, I can then look to all of John's writings to then understand more clearly what John means in a given passage. Bernie needs to get out of here. Send this guy out of here. Weekend and Bernie. Get him out of here. Okay. Let's see what John writes in the Gospel of John about a believer dying. Are you ready? Let's see what John writes in the Gospel of John about a believer dying. Let's go to John 8. Let's read 49 to 53. John 8, 49 to 53. Read with me. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I send to you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Let me repeat 51 again. Verily, verily, I send to you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. And Jesus is God. He is truth. He can't lie. Now notice their response. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keepeth my saying, he shall never taste death. See, they understood him. So someone keeps the word, never dies? Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead? Whom makest thou thyself? Who do you think you are? Okay. So if you believe in Jesus' word and you trust in him, you can never die. All right, that's one. Let's go to John 11, 25 to 26. John 11, 25 to 26. John 11, 25 to 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. So if you're dead, you'll be made alive when you believe in him. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me, is believing in me, shall never die believe believest thou this if you're believing in jesus you can't die you can't die all right let's go now to john 10 27 and 29 john 10 27 to 29 My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. If you're my sheep, you can't help but to hear my voice and obey my voice. And if you're my sheep, you will hear me. And if you're my sheep, you can't perish. You can't die. 
You can't be destroyed. No power can destroy you. No power can pluck you out of my hand. You will live forever and ever, my guarantee to you. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Hmm. So John, who wrote 1 John, also wrote the Gospel of John. And he quotes the words of his Master, who is God in the flesh, truth in the flesh, who says, He who is believing in me, he who hears my words and believes in it, those are my flock, they are my sheep, they always hear my voice, they can never perish, they're in my hand, and I'll preserve them to live forever. They cannot die. John 6, 39 to 40. John 6, 39 to 40. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing. Nothing, I will lose none of them, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believes on him is believing on him. If you're believing on Jesus, here's Jesus' promise, and he's almighty to save, believes on him, will have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So if you're believing on me, clinging to me, looking to me, you will never perish. No one can destroy you and pluck you out of my hand. I'm almighty to save. And by my almighty hand of power, I will preserve you. I will guide you. I will sustain you and then raise you and glorify you forever and ever. You cannot die because I'm almighty over death, over all creation, if you belong to me. Do you catch it? So since John cannot contradict what he wrote in the gospel, and since John cannot contradict the words of his master, clearly whatever 1 John 5, 16, 17 means, it cannot mean that someone who's made spiritually alive through faith in Jesus can spiritually die. It can't mean that unless John contradicts himself and what Jesus says. Because if you go to 1 John 5, 16, 17, don't start at 16 and 17. Go to 1 John 5, read 9 all the way to 13. 1 John 5, 9 to 13. Now let's look at the immediate context. 1 John 5, 9 to 13. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in him, himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of, gave of his son. And this is the record, that God hath given us, given to us, given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God. So if you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. So even that very chapter, he's already told you, if you're believing on the Son of God, you have eternal life. So then let's read verses 18 to 19, the verses afterwards. Verses 18 to 19, the verses afterwards. Same chapter now. 1 John 5, 18 to 19. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, meaning you won't make a habit of sinning. Your life won't be characterized by willful sin. Your life will be characterized by you fighting against sin and trying to live a holy life, though you may fail. Right? Unlike the world that lives in sin, indulges in sin, and glorifies in their sinfulness. They're known for their sinful behavior. They're characterized by sinful behavior, not us. We're characterized as a people that try to war against sin, strive against sin, and seek to live holy lives, though we do so imperfectly. That's what he's saying. So, but now notice 1 John 5, 18, 19. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and the wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God and the whole world life and wickedness. So wait, the same chapter says, by believing in Jesus, you have eternal life. If you're born of God, 
You will keep yourself by the power of the Holy Spirit so Satan can't touch you. Hmm. But then 1 John 5, 4 and 5. Same chapter now, folks. 1 John 5, 4 to 5. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. So if you're born of God and you believe in Jesus, you've already conquered the world. The world that lies in wickedness. The world influenced by Satan. You've conquered it. You've defeated it. You've overcome it. The world can't defeat you anymore. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. So hold on. You believe in Jesus. You're born of God. You keep yourself by the power of God. You've now conquered the world. You're victorious over the world. You've overcome the world. And the wicked one can't touch you. What else does John need to say to make it clear that if you're born of the Spirit and you're believing in Christ and you truly belong to Him, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, keep you and preserve you, making it impossible for you to perish. What else does John need to say? So what does John 5, 16 and 17 mean? First John 5, 16 and 17. If it's referring to a believer, let me explain. Because John doesn't come out and tell us. We know what it doesn't mean. Listen to me. We know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean someone who's truly born of the Spirit, made alive in the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, indwelt by the Spirit, trusting in Jesus, loving Jesus, who's kept by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who's overcome the world and can't be touched by Satan because the Trinity has sealed you forever. We know that person cannot die spiritually and be damned to hell, right? Right? It can't mean that. So when, what does it mean? If it's referring to a believer, it can mean this. Now, here's where the discipline comes in. If it is referring to a believer then it is saying that even believers can be disciplined physically and die physically because of sin in their lives. But their physical death doesn't mean they're not saved. It means that this was their punishment for their sin. So now God takes them out of the world and brings them into heaven in his presence. That God would cause someone to die physically who's a believer, to take them out of the world, because of that sin that's plaguing him, and then bring him into his presence where he rests from sin and struggles? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, 27 to 34. Yep, Christos, Anesti. Christ is risen indeed, and he can never die. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 34. What did Paul say about believers who ate the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner? Pay attention, guys. Pay attention, please. I need you to pay attention because we're going to end it right here. 1 Corinthians 11, 27, 34. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, if you take the Eucharist, Eucharisteo, Eucharisteo, right? The Eucharist in an unworthy manner. Pay attention, folks. Wherefore, wherefore whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of Christ. You'll be disrespecting, dishonoring the very bo body that was broken and the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. Don't you dare dishonor the body and blood of Christ. Now notice what he says. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not paying reverence to the Lord's body when you're taking the bread and the cup. Now watch what happens here. Here is the key. Pay attention. Verse 30. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Oh, wow. For this reason, those who have eaten the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner have gotten sick physically and fallen asleep. Now, the metaphor of sleep is beautiful. He didn't say die. You know why? Because if you're in Christ, you never die. You go to sleep. So by saying they sleep, he's showing they're still saved, though God took them physically out of the world. Let me read the rest of it, and we're going to look at 30 again. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. In other words, if I examine, man, I'm not ready to take the Lord's Supper. 
So that means I'll stop and refrain from taking it instead of going ahead and taking it and having God judge me. So judge yourself. Have you come in a worthy manner? Have you come prepared? Maybe fasted the day before? Kept yourself pure from watching things you shouldn't watch? And you shouldn't watch things you shouldn't watch. And may God save me from that. So that now you come to the Lord's Supper and saying, ah, my conscience is clear. I haven't seen things I shouldn't be seeing. I haven't said things I shouldn't say. I haven't done things I shouldn't do. I have no grudge and hatred towards any of my brothers and sisters. I can now take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, not fear God disciplining me. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. The Lord is disciplining you as a father disciplines a son or a daughter. That we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, eat, tarry one for another. Wait. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that we come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when, when I come. Did you understand what he just said? Post 1 Corinthians 11.30 and 32 one more time. Did you hear what he just said? Is the Bible... Well, hold on before I say that, because I want you to pay attention. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 30 and 32. Watch here. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. So Paul is making it clear. If there are some of you who have been sick physically and die physically because of sin in your life, that doesn't mean you do not belong to Christ, you went to hell. Quite the opposite. It means you do belong to Christ. So Christ disciplined you in this manner and took you out of the world so you can rest from these sins that cause you to grieve him and enter his presence because when Jesus disciplines you, that's a sign he doesn't want to condemn you to hell. So he disciplines you now and takes you out physically to be in his presence where you rest. So notice here, believers can be disciplined and can die, quote unquote, prematurely as a sign not that they're condemned to hell, as a sign that God is treating you as a child. And as a good father disciplines a child who's unruly, he disciplined you this way and took you out of your trials and temptations so that you don't have to struggle with sin anymore. Now you rest. Now you rest. That's why Paul said they're asleep, because a believer doesn't die. See, Paul knows the words of Jesus. Jesus says you can't die. So that's why believers don't say believers have died. They have entered their rest. They are resting. They're sleeping. Did you catch it? So 1 John 5, 16 and 17 may be saying that believers have committed a sin that resulted in them dying physically. So don't pray for that because they're dead to the world. They've left the world. They've entered Christ's presence. Why are you praying? They're physical. That means they're gone. They're no longer in the world. No longer the sinful flesh, no longer struggling with sin, no need to pray for that. They're gone. They have entered their everlasting rest. They're now complete, sin-free, pain-free, struggle-free. So why are you praying for that? Thank you, Cloudy. And making sense? Excellent questions. And I pray every answer that I gave was by the Holy Spirit guiding me in such a way to make sure I made no mistakes, but I interpret the word of God correctly and reverently for the glory of Jesus. If I made a mistake, may the Lord forgive me, correct it in me, not to repeat it, and save you from all errors. But everything I said was true. May the Holy Spirit implant that truth in the depth of our being and give us the power to love that truth, live that truth, proclaim that truth, and even die for that truth, because God is truth. The Father is truth. The Son is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. And the Bible is God's truth to us. May we live it in the power and life of the Spirit to glorify and love and honor the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. May the Lord save us from panicking, destroy our fear of the coronavirus, not to panic, to trust in Him, be calm and still, because Jesus will see us through and usher us into His everlasting kingdom. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Lord willing, it's now 5.30 my time, 7.30 p.m. New York time. If I do another session tonight, pay attention for the announcements on my Facebook page. It will be 9.30 p.m. or 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, New York time. It's going to be a late-nighter. 
I know some of you in the UK may be just getting up. So look for me around 9.30 p.m., 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This time I'm going to do a topic, if the Lord Jesus wills. Love you guys. Pray for me. Pray for my daughters. Pray for our health. Pray for my holiness. And pray the provision keeps coming in even through this panic so we can continue to teach for the glory of Christ. And join us on Discord. That's the link to Discord. I'm often there talking and answering questions too that are not recorded. Jesus loves us and he's in love with us. This we know because the Bible, God's truth, tells us so. And we love you, Lord Jesus. Maranatha.